You're listening to Booth Talk from the After Movie Diner. And to tie in with the live stream podcast conversation that we had the other day with Scott Toomey and Kimberly Cross, all about the 25th anniversary of Beautiful Girls, that's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the After Movie Diner. Go check that out. Um, we are very, very happy to have a conversation with one of the stars of the film. Uh, he plays the lovable sad sack Kev in the movie. It's none other than your friend and mine, Max Perlich. Uh We get into everything about Beautiful Girls, his co-stars, uh, being on Homicide Life on the Street, acting in Gummo, and even his wonderful array of hats that he's worn in a multitude of film roles that he's played over the years. It's an absolutely great conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. Uh, if you like Booth Talk and you already subscribed to the podcast, don't forget to rate and review, uh, share, like, comment, retweet, all that good stuff. Tell your friends, post it on socials, get the word of mouth out because it really does help. But without further ado, uh, let's listen to our conversation with the one, the only, the behatted Max Perlich. Hi, Max. This is John Cross from the After Movie Diner. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you uh, today. Beautiful Girls has become sort of the cozy movie of choice for my wife and I, and it turns 25 years old at the end of next week. So thanks ever so much for doing this. It's, it's great to talk to you about it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of, of course, sir. Of course. How did the film first come to you? The, fir- the film was uh, came to me through a film audition through my agent and management. Uh, she set me up with a call, which was called a reading, and you go and you read scenes that are given to you uh, beforehand uh, with other actors. And uh, it was at a hotel called the Peninsula Hotel in Suites in Beverly Hills. There were a lot. It was there were a lot of actors in this room uh, from. Vincent uh, Spano, Jennifer Beals, Chris Penn, Michael Rappaport. Uh, there were quite a, a good number of, of people that were in this room. And they were all actors that I had seen or known or worked with before. And they were coupling you with other actors to do the scenes that they had you play. And they coupled me with Chris Penn who was an actor that I had worked with his brother and I had known him but never worked with him or or sat with him in any length, length of time. Did my audition with Chris and the director who I had not met before, Ted Demi, said, that's great. Um, we, you guys want to come back? We, I, I love what you're doing. And Chris said, yeah. And I had another audition to go to. So I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to my other call and I'll come back. And he said, great, we'll put you guys down. So they ended up not going with Chris Penn. He uh, was not ultimately hired to do it. Uh, they got Matt Dillon, who I had worked with previously on a film called Drugstore Cowboy. Yeah. I ended up working with Chris Penn on his last film. I did uh, all my scenes were with him uh, in a film called The Darwin Awards with uh, Joseph Fine and uh, Winona Ryder and myself and Chris Penn and many others. Oh, so, wow, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we... Uh, I got put together with Matt Dillon, and Matt Dillon and I were old chums already, and uh, so that's how it came to me. And, and were you always auditioning for the part of Kev, or did you kind of read for a, yes. a, a bunch of people? No, I, 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 I just read for Kev. Nice. And I know that a lot of directors were interested in making the movie, and it finally landed with now, obviously, the sadly departed Ted Demi, who you were talking about. So to talk about working with him and his particular take on the story, how he ended up being so right for the film. Well, Ted was quite a gregarious, round fellow that was very sports, uh, sports world orientated and inclined. He was, you know, brought up around a lot of men that came from small working class towns that, that were, uh, you know, he, he, you know, had a lot in common with, and I think he, a lot of what was being uh, played out with these relationships in this film were familiar to him, 
growing up and in, in the, with, the, with the guys that he had as friends growing up probably and um, he was closer to that world because of where he was brought up uh, and uh, I think it made it, it made a lot of sense to him his take on it was very humorous and very close you know to these uh, he, he, I think what he did was try to try to be able to make humanize and make more available this uh this small town, uh, close knit working class uh, reality to the audience, with you know bringing a cinematic value to what was on the page in a in a uh, in a, a way where Adam Kimmel, the, the, the director of photography, was able to focus on the beauty of these towns, of the small details that a lot of people just don't aren't able to see because it flashes really quickly by them as they're passing. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely rings true. And it definitely uh, feels um, like you had the right people in place to capture exactly what you needed to about the, the, the small town and especially the cast who have a great authenticity about them. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, you worked with Matt Dillon in Drugstore Cowboy. Uh, so this was obviously a bit of a, a reunion. And then also you and the rest of the cast, I believe, went out to Minneapolis about two or three weeks before shooting to kind of bond and get together and so on. So I was out there a month and a half early to go buy records that Matt Dillon and I were and Timothy Hunt were the first few. I was the first one out there hanging out with Ted because I became close, uh, fast, close friends with Ted. Yeah. And uh, we had a lot of Italian meals in a, in a town with not many restaurants. Oh, great. Yeah. But it was cold. It, there were three other films at the hotel where we were. Uh, Fargo, Mall Rats, Healing, Minnesota. Oh, wow. And, uh, ourselves. Yeah, we were all at the Marquette sweets hotel was, was it one of those things where minnesota had a, a tax break or something how come there were so many movies make being shot in minnesota at the time uh, I, they were all centered around uh, snow i think oh okay and, uh, that uh, i don't know but fargo was minneapolis was the closest uh, company town for fargo i think well fargo sure. makes sense yeah no i understand that yeah oh that that must have been a a, a gas then all of you guys all being under one roof <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, uh, I I can I can attest to that for sure. What was sort of the, some of the things that you guys did uh, to bond and talk about your characters and kind of form your characters, or did you feel like it was very much on the page and you just spent the month like hanging out? What what happened? Yeah, it was very much on the page, but we had rehearsals. That's why we went early. We had these rehearsals, and uh, the rehearsals went well. We had meals, many meals. I went record shopping. Uh, I had my dog, Red, with me. It was a rescue dog that I took with me on tour, like wherever I went. Matt, uh, Matt Dillon and I busied ourselves with going record uh, record finding. We found many Latin Cuban records and many jazz albums. And uh, I had a conga and some bongos in my room. And we would sit up and play along to these jazz records and Latin records until all hours. And we kind of it was very cold there and there's not much to do as in, in public you know you don't kind of go out that's why they have these big walkways called uh, skyways yeah. because it's, it's a club you know city in Minneapolis it's very cold there um, it's like Cleveland, Ohio or Buffalo, New York if you've ever experienced the weather there or like uh, London in, in the very dead of winter it's just it's biting you know the, yeah. cold, the, the, the air is biting um, but yeah if we uh, I mean we very much just kind of tried to busy ourselves with being uh, in that town of Minneapolis. It didn't have much of a feel for a small town, so we visited uh, this town where we did a lot of photography called Stillwater, yeah. and it was a historical district of uh, right on the border of, of, uh, of Wisconsin. Uh, there was a bridge that, and a river that separated the, uh, the two uh, states. Yeah. Like, after the film came out for the screening, the the fellows that we were portraying from this small town in, in uh, Massachusetts, they, I believe it was Massachusetts, I'm not positive, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. think it was. And they came to me uh, uh, specifically, individually, and, and, and mentioned to me how much they enjoyed the, I think, the ensemble uh, 
portrayal of their group and how much it meant to them to feel that they were represented in a real in a realistic uh, and not uh, fancied up or you know uh, pushed uh, to the, in the wrong way. It was they thought it was appropriate and they were happy to be happy to speak with me and they just wanted to say, wow, you really you really made us feel like it was very familiar to us. I mean, it was a great honor or a great, uh, a, a great uh, privilege for me to be able to have some fellows that were being, their lives were being based on to come up and, and give me some, some vote of confidence in that, that they were not upset or, or unfairly or unduly uh, uh, portrayed, you know, so it, it was a bonus and a, and a very positive thing for me to be able to be a part of the, the portrayal of, of this town and, and these groups of friends. I was just saying that obviously the movie focuses uh, on the male friendships and has this great male ensemble at the heart of it, but often through the commentary of the other ensemble in the movie, which is obviously the female half of the cast. Again, another fantastic ensemble of, of actors there. What was the dynamic between the male and female cast on set? And, and were you all out in, in Minnesota in the lead up to the movie or? No, they, everybody came out. All the cast was asked out and we did rehearsals for a certain scene. Uh, Mira Sorvino, I think the only person that came in, uh, off and on was uh, Rosie O'Donnell because she had other duties for uh, work that she was contracted previously to uh, uh, believe that most everybody was out there, Uma Thurman, they were all, we were all out there for a good period of time. And yeah, the relationship between the male and females was, was um, derived from us understanding how the, the, uh, the hardships of the family uh, financial demographic uh, versus the the, uh, the price of living were tried to be realized by the production and by the from the writing staff to the to the portrayal. So I think that the actors had to kind of be in touch with uh, you know what they're dealing with, what 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 the odds were uh, up against in these towns and what. What, what it was like to, to try to have your own business, you know, we through through you know reading these scenes over and over again and trying to realize what social misnomers or common denominators were to be to be played were something that was you know it was unique to this town as opposed to the rest of the country. Like if you lived in Manhattan, you didn't have the same privileges or with your you know or 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 use of, of privilege for your time. You did, weren't able to develop friendships in the same way because it were centered around different activities. But if you're in a small town like we were, uh, it was centered around getting enough meat on the table to make your family strong, just like it was when we were part of a tribe or a village because we had to go out and hunt. So if you're not going to contribute to those endeavors, you're not going to get that, uh, that, that you're not going to have that peace or comfort at home. I think that is what we came to understand about that town, just like any working class uh, uh, community. Uh, it's about getting yourself uh, ready for the next day to go to work and having enough strength and, and resources to do so. Yeah, agreed completely. And 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 it, uh, I think, like I said before, the authenticity of the of the film and the characters and and uh, the story just. Um, I think that's what endears people to it. It's 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 not a movie that talks up or down to anyone. It's 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 about who it's about, and it's it, and everyone everyone loves those characters for good or for bad. I think yeah, thank you. I think we, you know, tried to have a real connection with what characters you play with as an actor. You try to make sure that you're paying, you know, you're paying to that, you know, you're being able to pay, uh, you know, your, 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 your purchase price to be able to achieve that reality on screen. You, you, you kind of, you know, pay a fee with, uh, the, the forces that be, which are a camera and lights and, and, uh, and the distractions of a set. And you've got to really just kind of know what you're going for, which is connecting with that individual 
on screen by making sure that you're 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 sincere with your eyes and what your body language is and so forth. Yeah. So when you have when you have an actress and a, a you have a female and a male interacting together, you're not thinking about well, do I get close uh, affectionately on? Is, is that important on screen? Uh, what is important is playing the scenes the way they were written and bringing uh, ingenuity or authenticity to it, not for the gleaming eye of a writer or director, but in the in the sense that you're earning it for the portrayal. It was not like I need to be good. I need to be correct. Yeah. Is what my thoughts were. And you've been part of many. You've been part of many great ensemble casts. Uh, what do you love about that? And one of the ben- what are the benefits of of being part of an ensemble? Well, you've got this, you know, reality that is juxtaposed with all of the normal distractions of a film set. You've got this understanding that you made a contract with yourself and the writer and the filmmaker to tap into what the same 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 goal is and to not not betray that to stick to that endeavor to persevere for the group for the greater good which is for the understanding of the work for it to be understood because it's being brought to a visual uh reality a a visual specificity instead of it just being a, a tale that is put on from pen to, from ink to paper, you, you have a metaphysical, so to speak, relationship as an audience member to these characters. Instead of your 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 imagination doing that work, it's you just sit back and 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 uh, go and, and and hang on for the ride, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ted, Debbie, I became to, known to me through this audition, and uh, and I I uh, had researched him a little bit, but basically I was kind of just starting off fresh with him as an individual and we became fast friends. I went there early. Uh, as I said, I went to go, I started uh, collecting records at the jet. Find what we usually do in a town is if you're going to be there for a couple of months is try and find the places that have the culture that you can get and uh, ready yourself with making your your apartment uh, cozy to, for the time that you'll be working. You don't have much time off, but you need a place that you can regulate and kind of switch off, you know? And so whatever you're, whether you're in an apartment or a hotel, you go record shop. I went record shopping ahead of time. And then Matt got jealous, Matt Dillon, that I was down there getting all the goodies. So he came down early. He was going to come two weeks before rehearsal, but he came a full month. I came a month and a half before shooting started. And I, you know, uh, hung out with the, with the camera crew and went on meetings and, and uh, location scouts and found out, some cool stuff about who I was working with, the you know, and uh, the professionals that, you know, and I, I really enjoyed that time. Uh, we're, you know, with Adam Kimmel, who's the director of photography and his crew and just getting on with them and finding out what their, what their mode of what their, what motivated them to, to, to get up and go every day and, and uh, do what they do. Yeah. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the camera department from Adam Kimmel being so uh, just really, really brotherly love, uh, you know, that you don't always get, as an actor, you kind of, you get shunned and you, you're already stigmatic. So I try to avoid those pitfalls most of the time by by reaching, by watching people work and what, what their, their art was and how their artistic process uh, applied, you know, how they applied it to, to the job, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and did you... Do you think you and Matt bonded over, like, were you also record hunting uh, on on the other set with Matt? Like, uh, are you and Matt, is that the thing that you bond on, is records, or do you? Uh, no, yes, we did, but no, we didn't. Yes, we did bond with records, but no, we didn't do that on uh, Drugstore Cowboy because he was uh, artistically engaged and had a... Uh, a uh, heavier workload. It was all bit, you know, right, right, right. you know, he, he really did, uh, really, he really, really ca- uh, came off, uh, if you will, in, with that performance of Drugstore Cowboy. Matt Dillon really, yeah. really re reinvented himself as my eyes, as an, uh, probably not to him, 
but you, you're your own worst uh, critic, you know, hardest critic. If you if you're at alive whatsoever, you definitely got to be hard on yourself. So I can only assume what he's thinking. But when I meet guys that are that are responsible, that are professionals, they usually are. They have the same body language that we all have, and unbeknownst to us, we're just hunched over, trying to go over what beats what what we've got to go to cat catch uh, for the sake of the film, you know, the, the greater good. Yeah, because Matt Dillon is a, is like my he's like my blood brother. He 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 became he he was the best man at my wedding. You know how he introduced me at my wedding? He said, "Ladies and gentlemen, this is Miss." Uh, Welcome. We want to welcome Mr. and Mrs. Monopoly Man because I had a top hat and tails, and uh, but I, I got him back for that. You know, I he had, to <laughs> sit, he had to sit through every dance. He couldn't leave. And Cameron Diaz was his girlfriend. Matt, those guys came into town later, as you said. Like Rosie O'Donnell came in late, uh, on and off. Uma Thurman came uh, because she was, I think, she was prepping for the film she was about to do, and she had already been booked on Ted's film uh, and Natalie Portman came to us and she was just such a, you know, just very young, a professionally postured young lady yeah. ready to work, you know, just ready with, she had done her research, done her work and she, there was nothing you could say about her that we needed from her other than what she brought to the table. She was an, an amazing young uh, professional, uh, very, and uh, you could tell she was, you know, quite already on her way. Uh, I think this is probably like the third film or, or so forth. I don't know what number this was. Do you? Yeah, she had done uh, The Professional. She had done Heat. And Beautiful Girls was her third one. Yeah, this was just before she did uh, Everyone uh-huh. Says I Love You and Mars Attack. She did um, well, Beautiful Girls, yeah. Everyone Says I Love You and Mars Attacks in the same year or in the lead up to the to 96. So. So yeah, that her yeah. first four or five movies are phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, so she was very well studied and, and real good kid. Yeah, Matt Dillon was, uh, you know, we'd already. I called him up and I'm like, hey, I'm over here getting records. So I'm at this place called Jaime's, and he goes, oh, really, buddy? I never, I never heard of Jaime, you know. And uh, he, he's like, I go, yeah, you never heard of Jaime's. You, it's a small little. You know, it's a neighborhood place. You you better get out of here. You know, yeah. are you gonna come out here early? He goes, buddy. I think I'm gonna come down tomorrow. You know, you're fucking. Uh, you 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 get everything, huh? I said, no, there's not much. He goes, I heard they don't got a pomodoro sauce that saves their life down there in uh, Minneapolis. But I'm gonna come down anyway, pal. So he came down early, and uh, sure enough, he went and started buying all the stuff and telling the owner of the place that he was gonna give him more money, and. The next week, all of the records I was buying were up on a wall for with higher prices on them. Oh no, Matt, he jacked up the prices because Matt, Matt showed up. Well, huh? Matt came in and, and, and Matt came in and paid the guy and Jaime. He goes, ah, listen, uh, yeah, this stuff I can't find it for anything in New York and Manhattan, man. You got really good prices, and so Jaime, you know, took his cue and put everything up for higher prices on the shelf, you know, where it was only in like a dollar bin, you know, before yeah. all the Latin stuff. Uh, so is that, Matt, is that your then, favorite type of music? You mentioned that yesterday. Is the, is the Latin jazz kind of your favorite kind of music, or is that just what you were into at the time? Uh, listen, I like charanga, bugalu, uh, uh, watusi too. Uh, I, I'm into the the uh, the shingling, the the shangalang, the hook and the boogie, and the hook and the sling, the 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 uh, the, the mother popcorn. Uh, I'm into the you know the the what you know, the different, different, uh, you know, like you got, you got a pachanga, charanga, uh, you got, you know, the, all the different shingling, shangalang, you know, based on, they're all based on one dance and then they, they branch out with different names that are similar, right? right. Popcorn, mother popcorn. So that was the land of a thousand dances. So I'm really into like that era, uh, from like, let's say 58 to 68. You know, uh, and 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 then you have soul and RB being predominant on the market. But you have the marketplace, and then you have the you have what's popular at the dances. So there's a difference. But I really am into Latin. Uh, my brother had a radio show called United Groove, and it was on uh, the Latin, the jazz channel in LA 
K Jazz K uh, eighty eight point one, and it was um, my father was a disc jockey, my brother was a disc jockey, I was a disc jockey, but my brother had a show for ten years, that, and the Cuban community really championed my brother and was very thankful for what he did for salt for the music, and it was right before Cuban, but before Ry Cooter, you know, uh, re re, you know, you know, gave another. Uh, visual uh, on uh, what Afro-Cuban music or what the African Cuban marriage meant. And with, what, yeah, with Buena you know, Vista Social Club. We had been collecting these rhythms that were like Son Montuno, you know, the songs, they're, they're religious, they're folkloric music, yeah. and you have all the artists, it's just like being a jazz fan, you get the guy who's the the, the instrument player and what his, his what, how he based his his voicing and what he quoted in his solo and what he was saying to the other musicians by quoting the classical, you know, phrasing, which is what you see in jazz. You know, you see guys that'll say D for two when they're doing it or they'll, they'll, they'll vice versa. will be quoting uh, some Tchaikovsky uh, movement, uh, you know, or a, 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 uh, a, something that's very kitsch to be able to relay their boredom in the tempo of what they're playing and just communicating. That's what the solo is. Modern solos were right. achieving. Do you not, you, are you with me on that? I know I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm a musician. So I know, I know where you're coming from and what you're talking about. Oh, you um, are. You're, you know. Yeah. Were you, were you uh, trying to convince other members of the cast to like, were you, were you playing them the records and, and fanatically yeah. talking to them about it and stuff? Um, yeah, no, but Matt Dillon and I was, I've always been, I, I've had radio shows in different towns when I'm working on a film, they'll ask me to, you know, I'll go on the college and then take over for a, a night with another actor and yeah. do kind of fun stuff like that. That was always fun to do. I wrote it for a couple, uh, I was into punk rock when I was a young kid before I was disc jockeying and I wrote it for a couple of bands, Circle Jerks, uh, with this guy Keith Morris was, was a modern day Robin Hood and so I followed him and, and they let me drive their car I was only 14 but nice. I drove their 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 van and then I was friends with uh, Anthony and uh, Michael uh, Flea the bass player from uh, they went to my high school uh, Fairfax uh, the Chili Peppers and they that whole funky punk because I had been friends with so it was Gene Kelly uh, the uh, the dancer the singer and dancer Singing in the Rain. Are you yeah, familiar yeah. with Gene Kelly? Yeah, of course. So he, he was the homeowner, and and he had a son that I grew up uh, knowing. His son was a little bit older, but uh, Tim Kelly had one side of the house on Rodeo Drive, and Gene, his father, had the other side, and he, he, they both had an upstairs and a downstairs, and they had a fountain drink machine. And so we would have pool parties. It would be uh, black members of Circle Jerks, the Chili Peppers, Fishbone, who I, I grew up with uh, and still good friends with different members of that band. And uh, I was uh, new music producers that were roadies that were from, you know, just all over that, that were a part of the funk scene left over from P funk, the, the Bootsies. These are young kids that were heavily influenced, but they were road technicians and music, you know, guitar techs that were the sons of, of other roadies. And they ended up combining funk and, and punk to make funky punk, to make the, it was not blues. I mean, uh, 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 Jelly Roll Morton and the Red Hot Chili Peppers was anything but what Red Hot Chili Peppers band was that, uh, you know, George Clinton produced. And, uh, you know, uh, they had, uh, they, they had influences that were based on, on a funk. Uh, and punk was what they, what their, their energy was. I just really got to give it to Matt because he, he doesn't phone it in. He really does try to, to uh, you know, participate in, in a film that could have just been, you know, a yawn for him. I know about him being friends with him that he doesn't enjoy playing the jock, uh, uh, pretty boy, right? You know, but he's called on to do it quite often. I, I, I guess in the movie, he's asked the best thing about him is he's asked to question that persona. That's why it works. Is he's his character is questioning that persona of the guy who in high school was, you know, the shit, but now uh, as he's older, he he doesn't know what he's doing with himself. And I think Matt 
the best thing about him is he has that soulfulness so that um, you can see him trying to resist ability. Yeah. Yeah. Resist what his situation is now. But at the same time, when he's uh, uh, in the bar and the, and the, the, you know, the preppy guys are there, his his girlfriend's husband is there, you know, he can step up to it as well. So like he has that, that's what's good for about him in the role. He's able to play the strong, you know, you don't F with me kind of guy, but he's also got that vulnerability to it where he's looking to the future and looking to his life. Yeah, I agree. I think he did a, a and he had a balancing act there on a high wire and he uh, was able to, you know, bring some subtlety to that. Uh, and what we did was very inherent to what we already knew as Chump. Uh, it, it was not hard to work with Matt and he made it very, uh, you know, just, very pleasure very it was a, a lovely uh uh experience to be able to have ted direct us yeah and noah emmerich have you worked with him before he's he he like you i feel like is one of those uh fantastic character actors who kind of shows up in a in a ton of stuff and is always the best thing in it kind of thing have you had you worked with noah emmerich or is your path crossed with him since it has passed since i had not worked with noah uh previously to to the beautiful girls but uh he was described to me by ted as a uh he he was part of a barbershop quartet he he and his brothers and his uh had a were were harmonizers Mm -hmm. and uh and he never mentioned anything about any like you know what his background was i had not known any of his work and i come to find that i i really appreciate this what he does as this uh you know, kind of big, uh, silent, uh, bear, uh, if you, you, you know, he, he, he just, he definitely brings, uh, he's a big guy and he doesn't have to have a big presence, but he, and he brings a, a small voice, uh, and, and he, he pivotal ways in the roles that he's done. I appreciate his work and, and, and how he, uh, brings finesse to it right he 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 does it well he plays the the family he plays the family man with with one foot still in his old high school buddies he he plays that that role very well yeah. and when he finally he in a, in a, the truman show right yeah yeah he's in that as well yeah of course i mean he crops up in so many things he's he's one of those uh great familiar faces that that just like i say bolster any movie that they're in like yourself a great face He's got. Thank you for saying so. He's got a great face. Well, I love Noah, having worked with him once and having had a you know frozen in time experience like I did with most of those people. It's it's a very special thing going on location with a group of uh, of, of artists because you're you're becoming a, co- a real tight family for three three months, three and a half months, and then you that's it. It's like gone. Poof. Hopefully, what you all labor I had a labor of love uh with uh during these three and a half months uh where you were in this town that's not your own town you're on on a mission with a group of of highly trained professionals and god willing it will be achieved the 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 greater uh good that the greater goal that everybody signed on to because they all believed in uh the mission statement you, you feel me yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, I definitely agree. And I think that, uh, you know, whatever mission you guys were on, uh, it was definitely achieved in the final uh, the final film. What's interesting about the movie is obviously both sort of Matt Dillon and Timothy Hutton um, had both been uh, and still are leading men. And here they are kind of leading this ensemble. They have kind of two storylines that run side by side in the film. Uh, what was that like for Tim, and 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 how did he play well in the ensemble? Well, I think it's uh, Tim came to town early, uh, and I mean, I love the dude uh, just for you know being a brother. He was very down to earth, a real easy guy to work with, very professional. But there, but 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 there wasn't any. So between sort of him and Matt, then that, like on set, he was just. Uh, Tim Tim Hunton was fairly relaxed. Then, is what you're saying? He he didn't try and like push his ego about yeah. the place or anything like that. Like, oh, no, there, there was no need for that on this set. Good, good. That's good to hear. That's nice to hear. Because you know they both yeah, been no. they both been leading men. They're both still leading men. And and this is obviously a movie where it only works uh, if you come to play in a group. 
this movie, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad they both yeah. did. That's awesome. Yeah, they are. They, they did what they should have done. And I would have given a swift kick in the ass or Ted would have, because we were all trying to get there and we had the rehearsals and I love what I'm grateful for what I'm able to do. I love being a part of these, 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 these families. When we go out in a town, I love uh, learning about the history and art and, it's a, it's a it's a lovely, you know, endeavor to want to persevere through being a filmmaker, a part of socially responsible educational film. Rosie O'Donnell was very uh, loud, gregarious, and she was a very professional. Did her part. She was really good at it. The reality of of what she was doing was the only way to achieve it was by getting loud and becoming real expressive with your your arm movements when you came into a room, and you'd always try to like. If she knew that like entertainment was there tonight or whatever, she would she would run after the host of whoever was the reporter for those companies that were going to do press on the film, and she would do be a tour guide, and it was very you know it would be very sweet and funny. It was a big stark contrast yeah. between the way we were working independently uh, on a on a quiet set and to when she would come in. So you know her and Michael Rappaport were these. Just very loud at New Yorkers. You know? I mean, they both have they both have big personalities, and for the parts they're playing, it works. I, I think you're right. I think if either of them were the lead, then it would be a, a different story, and it would be grating. But I feel like you drop those characters and those actors <laughs> into the film when it needs a bit of you know pep, and it and it works. Yeah, man. I think Ted and uh, Scott are responsible for having certain information like details be relayed to an audience as their road guide, as their kind of roadmap, a guide, if you will, to have kept their interests, have kept their, 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 their romantic uh, and, uh, ambition as an audience uh, alive to just keep them uh, for the ride. Uh, there's certain info that has to be passed on for the, for the plot lines to exist with each other. And some filmmakers make the, they overdo it and they, they they try to redo shit on right as you're about to shoot. And it really is a shame because it has to be by the numbers for a reason. There is a formula for you can, not everything can just be artistically, you know, hoped for. There is a, a protocol and a process that filmmakers uh, base their work, their, their production on. And that's so important to understand role separately. These actors are, are great for what they were cast to do individually, but it ended up that this, this cast really did a uh, tidy job. I felt that I was a part of something that was worth portraying at, the, at that time in this country. It was important to have somebody to cuddle up with and to know that you could count on uh, these characters being you know, portrayed in a responsible way. That's what you came to know out of your enjoyment of that film is that it wasn't a, a, a extremely well written or well, uh, well, anything about it you couldn't really say was like groundbreaking, but it was very heartfully produced and, and it was very, very um, effective. Uh, and the actors, I can tell you, let their guard down and tried to bring as much love and uh and conflict to the screen and i don't know why but i think ted demi is a guy that got results like no one else because he was a sweet heart and he was we were all along for the ride with ted and his producer yeah i think i think no i think that's the best thing is that ted, whatever ted's um personality and heart and emotion was uh and putting these individuals sort of into each of the parts and in, into each of the scenes and organizing them and then presenting them using Scott Rosenberg's roadmap. Uh, I think what he did was uh, kind of wrap his arms around the movie so that when you watch yeah. it, even though I can't point to any one particular scene that anyone would consider cozy, the whole movie has a cozy movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, but what you said is true. Like I say, even though... There's not one particular scene that's all about like, you know, everyone loving each other or whatever. The whole movie has that vibe to it. And that comes from not just the cast, but what Ted was doing, I think, behind the scenes. Yeah. 
Well, dude, he tried to spend a lot of money and energy. They all did trying to have snow when there was no snow. And that's a whole nother battle all in its own that's hilarious. You know, obviously you stay in touch with Matt. You guys are close. Um, was, yeah. were there, was there any other kind of friendships forged on the film that have maintained? Or was it just um, kind of that moment in time? Well, Ted and I obviously had, had, had growth during that time. Yeah. And we based our work on that film became chumps and he gave me a position at his production company he gave me the the, the gravity the, the creative uh author, you know privilege to, to work with in a in a in a in a way which i would never have been understanding uh, on my own team uh, in my to my to my understanding of where i was and uh uh ted i, I feel like i was given a gift to be able to understand these worlds that in most of the films that I get to work on, I go about trying to find road markers for that, under, that, that sensibility. We all became, stayed friends uh, to that, to the best of our ability. Like Rappaport thought uh, he'd be, he, he would call me, he would call me and he would call Matt and Matt would call me and say, man, you gotta like call Matt Rappaport and get him to like, get off my leg right now. I can't deal with this. He's, he lives in the same city as me. I'm like, I'm in California, man. I don't know what the fuck you're calling me for. But yeah, I'll call him. And uh, so, you know, and that, so, but I before thought he, he would, like, hey, how you doing? Tim and I played well together. We sang together in that film. And I'm not really, I don't have a voice anymore, but I had fun with him, uh, and working with him. And we did keep in touch. He, he and I and uh, Matt, and I would say, uh, and Ted were the, you know, I stayed in touch with them. Uh, of course. And you were you were part of one of the best casts ever assembled on television uh, with Homicide Life on the Streets, uh, one of my favorite all-time shows. Uh, what was it like stepping into that cast and working on that show? Oh, wow. It was a huge, like a new kind of a really scary world to try to, to get into, like it not, that, I, that you don't know about. Homicide was just such a uh, I mean, I mean, it was a huge machine that was already in in, in movement when I got there, and, and I knew that I was stepping into some shoes that I had to fill. That there was no time for me to try to second guess, and they uh, were potentially going to contract me uh, for a, uh, a good work, uh, you know, call uh, a contract and so forth. So I was put on notice in that regard, but. I uh, felt as though it was something like I said, uh, like I had mentioned, it was already in in play, and I just had to get with it. And I saw this very dangerous and you know different world from where I came from, and from what what I was understanding about work and about the real world in both regards, as opposed, you know, like the crime that went on in a city versus what you saw on TV shows about crime and what was real and what wasn't. And you had the police, the local police from this town, calling in to let you know you you had fucked up by running over some bullets in the last episode, or that you didn't, you know, have things correct per regular regulation or per what their protocols and standards were for their local uh, police uh, union and the different unions. There was a lot of, you know, stuff that was that was knew to me that I didn't know about my work, about work, that it would be this engaging and uh, uh, there were that many uh, aspects to it. I just was used to showing up and uh, playing the scenes, but this was a, a whole uh, a whole different world. Uh, it was a big world and it was something that was dangerous and uh, you know, unexplored to me by me. No, that's that's fascinating. I mean, I knew that it was it was sort of obviously based on um, a lot of kind of true stories and a lot of experience. But oh, I, no, 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 it was, it was all it was, the writer of the show was a guy that I was kind of portraying because David Simon was a guy that went around. My character was loosely based on what he did. On what he when did. He yeah. rode around with, with police officers with the radio. You know, I got there. The first week, the uh, main writer, James Yashimura, he was one of the writers, staff writers that lived out there. He said, 
uh, let me take you around and introduce you when I first got there, whatever time of day I was. And he was talking about the colorful crowd crew consisted of. And, uh, you know, the, the, the right hand, I didn't really realize at the time, you know, what he meant. But I came to know that they were a swashbuckling group of, uh, they were pretty rough, they were ruffians, you know, and they were uh, definitely on the side of the uh, artful dodger, if you will. Uh, they were characters. I mean, any point in Baltimore, there is uh, a very dangerous demographic. In Baltimore, uh, Ted came and directed, you know that Ted directed an episode of Homicide, a couple of them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ted Demi, he directed, in any case, the guy, the writer, said, why don't you come with me and I'll show you around? And I said, all right, that sounds like a good deal, you know? And he takes me across the street to a bar. He goes, we film in here, but this is where we hang out. We rented a building that allowed us to have this big building. They, they since turned it into a hotel, but it was the main pier building down there on Tame Street, and it faces the, the bay. And it was a long pier, and we used it. We built our stage on it, our production office, and we... We used the, it became the police station, uh, Baltimore PD. Yeah. And we also housed all of the vehicles that were used in the photo play of the, of the, of the show. And the, the producer, the main producer, uh, the line producer, the, uh, the production manager, his name was uh, Jim Finnerty, F-I-N-N-E-R-T-Y, Finnerty. Yeah. And he, he, uh, he was a very strict uh, governor, and he definitely kept people on their toes and he had two guns that he kept in his desk that were both 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. One he kept blank uh, loads, shots in and the other he had real uh, cartridges, real shells, real uh, bullets. Uh, you'd get called in there and I didn't know this at the time but they'd say Ah, oh, Affinity wants to see you. And I'm like, what the fuck does he want to see me for? What did I do? I just came on the show. <laughs> uh, what did I do? Like, fuck, well, what could it be? I was there for a while already, and uh, I had uh, one of the stories I'll tell you that goes with this guy, Jim Finney, is Yafit Koto, who was one of the cops on the show, an actor, and he has a, a long story career. As a kid, you know, he played a lot of political figures and so forth, and cops. And I still am trying to be, uh, I was ambitious, but I was also trying to be my idea of sincere or professional. And I said, hey, Mr. Uh, the, the Chicago, and I knew people that I worked with that worked with him for years. But I had, I'm not trying to have any clout or any push with what I'm saying. I just came on to his show, and I was about to do a big scene with him, and I was a little bit, just I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, in anticipation, uh, nervous uh, in many different ways as a young man is. But I was a little uh, self-conscious, all those things mixed into one. But I wanted to do well, so. I thought I'd be putting my first, my best foot forward. And I said, I'm Max, and I thought, you know, I just want to know if you want to, if there's anything, if you want to run, go, you know, go through this or talk about this. You got my attention. If you need me, I'll make myself available. And he's like, what? For what? And I said, and he's tall. He's really tall. And I had to kind of like try to be on my tippy, or he had to kind of bend down to talk to me. Yeah. And I said, uh, you know, if you want to, if there's anything you want to go over about this, he goes, listen, kid. I'll see you up there. I, I, what I know is what I know. What you know is what you know. And he said that, and he kind of just turned his, you know, turned his body language for me to <laughs> be dismissed. Yeah. And I and I dismissed myself and <laughs> turned around and you know went up there to do the scene. But as it happened, uh, he became cut up in the photography of of the of the scene, and he broke character and laughed because of the the uh, behavior of my character. And he broke. And then afterwards, he came up to me and he said, Hey, man, that was pretty good. Uh, what's your name again? Da, da, da. And then we had an instant bond from then on in. And I didn't do anything extra. I just did what Max was doing. Yeah. Trying to, you know, do the little character, whatever the fuck I was doing. I, I was based on what they wrote. And I didn't, I'm not ad libbing shit. I'm not trying to ad lib on someone's, someone's, their hard work. You know, I don't yeah. ever fuck with it take privilege with people's work like that and and i can only imagine i mean on screen yafet kodo has such presence and seems such a a, a domineering <laughs> figure i can only imagine what he's like in real life he's 
the fucking rhinoceros. Yeah, right. He's, he, 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 I mean, you, you know, he's a hard guy. He's a hard nut. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. I didn't try to get in there and try and, you know, I did. I really did not try to fuck with him like that. I just was. I literally was trying to. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I was going. Maybe that. Maybe he was just letting me know. And I'm. And I thought it played out perfectly afterwards because I just was like, man, uh, man, I should have. I should change the way I. You know, hunt. you know, I, I thought about the way that maybe I had tried to introduce myself to him yeah. and that it was maybe the best way in the future because of the lesson I learned in that in that uh, experience, because he liked me anyways, regardless of what I if I would. I tried too hard. You know, that's the kind of lesson I thought I took from it. Maybe, yeah. You know, what I mean, you got to be you got to be hard on yourself. Yasser Koto's a big dude. You know, when you're walking behind him, you, you're like, you better, you know. There's several things you gotta do so that you don't die. You might fucking, you know, you might fucking, you might. I I had to go up the stairs of these rickety ass 1870s buildings in ba- in Baltimore when we were on location. Yeah. Just going up these, like you don't know what you're going up. You know, you can be you, shit can be, you can die and shit instantly. Yeah. From 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 something just not being checked out. Like it's not the code. It's just the steady cam operator and the actors going up. With the walkie-talkie, yeah, you know? and you just hope that it 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 holds steady. <laughs> and you just hope that it, you're not behind Yafin Koto. You you just feel the whole ground. It's like it's no joke. It's no joke. He was real. Yeah, he was a strong strong presence. He made sure you knew. And and what happened with Finity? But he's a nice guy when you get to know him. I know you want to hear about Finity. So what happened is when I get there the first day, the Japanese writer goes, "His name's Jay Josh Bro. You got to yeah. go over here to the park. Come on, let's get a drink." Uh, I see this scar on my cheek. Yeah, I got that with these fellows. Uh, but Jim Finity brought me, they called me down to his office. And I'm like, fuck, what did I do? And I just got there, so I know I wasn't in trouble. I didn't, like, I don't cause a lot of ruckus, but but they're like, go down and see him. I was like, whoa. Well, I was like, okay. And I went down, and his, his really sweet secretary, and she's a, a sniper. She gets shit done because she's a she gets, she's a top power play player. Right. She just, you know, you got to know her position. She calls me. I go in, I go, I go to the secretary. Hey, it's Max. How are you? Oh, I'm good, Max. How are you? Hi. So yeah, you know, you having fun? Everything good? And I'm like, I know she knows exactly what it is, but I can't be, you know, I'm just being, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm here to see Jim. So there, I can't hear anything going on in there, but I just know he's waiting for me. And I had heard stories about him, but I didn't do anything. You know, I'm just like, why am I thinking like this? <laughs> and as soon as I, I walk in, I take a left, right past her desk to go into his office, which has a door that's already open. And bam, bam, he fired on me and I hit the deck. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, the fuck? I had a heart attack, practically. Of course. <laughs> and I got up and he's like, look, come over here. He goes, hey, Max, right? And I go, yeah. He goes, all right, kid. See this other gun? That one has real cartridges in it. Those are blanks. It's got, it's got the picture? Don't fuck around over here. He goes, don't fuck up here. He goes, you know, he goes, just do what you got to do. What you got to do. Do what you, we do. And don't, and, and then you won't have to hear from me. And I'm like, okay, yes, sir. Wow. Yep. Wow. And he had been working on the show the whole time. All his kids are fucking, he was the main dude on, Dog Day Afternoon, the lead got lead man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking, you know. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's a good job that he didn't confuse the two guns. <laughs> I hope he had them labeled or something. <laughs> quite, quite, quite. <laughs> so, just a, f- a few questions we have from our. Uh, we have a Facebook group where we take questions for some from some listeners. And a friend and journalist of Pinland Empire wanted me to ask you about your scene in Gummo, uh, Harmony Corinne's movie. Um, how was it filmed? How, how, how long did it take? And what was the vibe on set? What was it like working with someone like Harmony? Gummo, Gummo. Uh, Harmony Corinne was known to be uh, introduced by Kerry Woods on the set of, sorry, on the production uh, offices of Beautiful Girl in Minneapolis. He came as a guest of one of the producers that was friends with the uh, film companies. Uh, he was one of the producers, those who produced Kerry Wood. He brought him uh, to Harmony to visit with us, and uh, I met him there for the first time. And uh, as I met another friend of Kerry Wood, David Blaine, who's a 
magician. And I don't know what, what their relationship with Terry was, but he it, it had them both as guests different times. However, he came to visit and uh, he was far out. I did feel a little bit uncomfortable just about the way that he, you know, carried himself and the company he kept was uh, very eclectic in the rudest the definition of the term. He, you know, just was a young cat that was acting wild, like sticking a cigarette in his behind and trying to get some sort of uh, reaction from who was viewing it. Because of how his paid status, a lot of people get put on because they got capital behind them. So I don't know how they put him on, but he got put on and he did a very uh, all improvisational piece that he, I don't know how he retained my services, but he got them. I was friendly towards him, but not his friend. You know, I was just a plaything. He put me up, and then when I got there, they sprayed my hair with paint, and they uh, they had me do some improv scenes. And the scene was strictly improvisational. There was no loose, there was a loose, you know, uh, description of the characters that would be in the scene and uh the whole film was like that he told me he was just telling people like he showed up in places that were nightmarish memories to him as a child growing up in nashville people did not know that he was originally from nashville but he showed up there and rudely pronounced himself on their doorsteps a lot of the times the people that had repulsed him or he'd had bad experiences with and through payment uh, from the production was able to get them on film and bring people together for, you know, wacky uh, mashups, you know, uh, improvisational, yeah. improvisational ar- artistic uh, endeavors, what they are, you know, just little kids. So, you know, in the, in the, the way that they pieced it together with the, he did a brilliant job of using those kids coupled with a soundtrack and uh, a good editor. Okay, so we're just going to take a break in this interview very quickly for a couple of commercials, but we'll be back after that talking all about beautiful girls and wrapping up the conversation with Max Perlich. If you like beautiful girls, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the after movie diner, where we had a full episode all about beautiful girls where we discussed uh, the movie, the characters, our favorite scenes, our theories, our feelings about it now versus then all that good stuff so do check that out and if you're enjoying this interview or if you've enjoyed any of the interviews on booth talk from the after movie diner don't forget to rate and review us on whatever podcast platform allows you to rate and review us Uh, also share uh, retweet like comment uh, all that good stuff uh, because that really does help anyway here are a couple of commercials and then we're back with more interview yeah, obviously, someone like uh, Ted Demi, uh, um, you know, I think everyone talks about him uh, in such high regards uh, that I've ever heard or, or read about. And and this movie, um, Beautiful Girls, you know, it's it's going to be 25 years old uh, next week. I believe it came out on the 6th or 7th of February in 1996. And wow. um you know, I don't know, but but uh, were you aware that it was coming up on the 25th anniversary? Have you reached out to either the cast or crew or someone that you knew in Minnesota when you were making it to just to kind of share those emotions and those thoughts of of the film? Or is this sort of the first time you're talking about it? Oh, this I'd love to reach out to some other people. I I I I, I did not know that it was turning 25, and I did it did have a very positive impact, and and I I hold it very close to my heart. I I definitely you know was a part of a lot of the the tender loving care that went into uh, understanding that the big big picture and as I was blow uh, the film that I the other film I did with Ted uh, and uh, you know I I would love to be a part of anything that they're doing and participate and pay my pay my respect you know yeah I mean I just want to let you know from the audience and I'm sure you hear it from uh, from people you meet a lot but um, It's one of those films, you know, I said at the beginning of our conversation when we first talked earlier that, uh, 
you know, it's it's become just a regular cozy favorite that my wife and I can kind of put on and enjoy sort of when it, where whenever we're in the mood it's 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 one of those you can watch any day it works on a saturday night and it works on a rainy sunday afternoon you know it's it's a great movie um but it i it's the reason why i was interested in kind of reaching out to the cast and talking about the 25th is that i feel like it's one of those movies that has a very broad audience whenever i talk to people online everyone loves it. Everyone was sending me messages and questions for you. And, you know, my friend Dean Garman said that, please just tell him how much I love the film and your character in general, Mac. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I feel like it's one of those movies that has a, a wide audience, but maybe a movie that people wouldn't think to celebrate the 25th anniversary in the way that they would necessarily celebrate other movies but it should be celebrated uh um in in the way that you would celebrate i I don't know in the way that people celebrate if you look at the movies of the 90s that came out of that time you know they celebrate quentin tarantino's movies they celebrate kevin smith's movies robert rodriguez's movies that whole stable of directors and i feel scott rosenberg and ted demi uh you know who made uh, beautiful girls you know they did i think that deserves the same kind of it's 25 years it's important everyone loves the movie it should be talked about i agree and i'm thankful for for the for the realization and 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 let's let's give thanks and let's uh, let's be happy about what lo- what tenderness and what uh what warm fuzzy feeling that you are able to to receive from this kind of film and what it does or the it's a healing art it becomes art you know film becomes a healing art at that point because it's used to to revive and to warm up and to get you know get get from out of the cold and to heal wounds you know and 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 rekindle uh good feeling and and heal you know uh, repair bridges that need to be repaired you know from bridges that have been yeah and it's a broken it's it's got the family element it's got the battle of the sexes it's comedic it's emotional uh you know it's got great uh uh, commentary on kind of male friendships and male ensemble as well as having great commentary on kind of female solidarity and and yeah it's fantastic yeah it's it's kind of got a bit of everything and one one of the stories that you'll get a kick out of that i can share with you is it was relayed to us that to to I got okay. I was in the lobby after work, waiting for my friend for Matt. And we were going to go up and and listen to some of the records we had bought yeah. when we were off, and play. I was going to play conga and play. We were going to have some dinner or something. I don't know. But uh, I was waiting for him, and Uma Thurman shows up and in the lobby, and instantly I'm looking at Matt and Tim Hutton go into like attack mode, like battle. Like guards went up, and like you know all these different different like shields and different like uh armory all of a sudden was put into play and like they were you know started hearing these buttons of different uh guns that were being put into position and they're actually trying to like you know outdo each other matt dylan and tim hunt and i'm sitting there in the middle <laughs> looking at it with urban i mean i can't now imagine trying to climb up that ladder and they're like battling themselves stepping on themselves trying to outdo them and it was hilarious. It was just hilarious. I in the elevator. I'm like, I, I said, Matt, you're a little short for her, don't you think? He goes, Listen, buddy, I don't want to hear that kind of shit from you. You're a little Jew. Just shut up. <laughs> and I'm like, Matt. I said, Okay, no problem. I I understand. But I mean, Tim Hutton, he's got an Academy Award. What are you going to do? Yeah. So it, so life <laughs> like, life imitated art. Then it's exactly like the scene when she first walks into the bar and everyone starts puffing up their oh, chests. <laughs> true. True that. Oh, that's that that's word. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't let the interview go by. So without mentioning the fact that you are uh, the king of great hats on screen, um, you just wear a hat very well, and a lot of your characters wear great hats. Is this something that you personally bring to a character, or have you just been lucky to play a lot of characters where the costumer has said, "Put a hat on"? <laughs> uh, well, my daughter came in to the room. I remember one day she was about four years old and I was asleep and uh, I lived in a loft and she came in and she wanted to get up and we were going to do something and I was lollygagging and she said, Dad? I said, yes, we are. Yeah, Dad? 
I said, yes, Maya. What is it, honey? She said, why are you bald? And I said, uh, well, honey, I'm follically challenged. You know, it's a different thing. Yeah. Know? It's uh, it's not genetic. It's uh, something that happened to me. I lost my confidence. And she said, oh, that's not funny, Dad. And so, you know, I no, I, I, uh, I appreciate, I have a relationship with a hat maker that's the last in business. They're the studio hat maker. They did everything for, like, when I played Meyer Lasky, they, they did the hats. They did the hats for every Clint Eastwood movie. They, his last film, yeah. he just did. They, they happen to be working on the picture that I'm actually currently working on, which is a secret. So I have a relationship with this hat maker. He's one of the last in the business. And the hat making is a lost art. And uh, it has to do with the steam as fuel. Steam runs the whole shop when you're making hats. And you have to have French. This is turn-of-the-century machinery that you have to have to have a business like this. And there's only one left in L.A. on the West Coast. And I have this relationship with this guy who inherited the business from Eddie Barron. Barron Hats yeah. was the name of the company. It's still called Baron Hats, but he makes a Hamburg. I mean, I've got hats from London. Hats from London from Lock and Lock and Sons. You know who Lock and Lock and Company is? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yep. So I've got a hat of theirs. You know, I mean, it, it, forget about what it's worth. It's just a piece of history. Yeah, of and course. And he, he, this guy has has Robert Blake's cup and the hat that Bogart wore in tra Trails Sierra Madre. Oh or, wow! You know? Yeah. And, and and Robert Blake was friends with him. Robert Blake tried to. Would show he just told me the story, this guy Mark, of how and he took over Baron Hats because he was the shop foreman for Eddie Barron, who was the owner. So he did every picture from the thirties on in Hollywood up until Eddie Barron passed and he now he has a shop. He moved to downtown LA. It's belt driven, steam powered um, machinery that turn of the century stuff. It was the latest it was built was like nineteen twelve is like is the stuff he works with, these aluminum forges and, 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 and these these uh these these molds that he has to use and it's amazing the art that he does. So I took one of the actors I'm working with on the film to see this today and the guy had all my hats repaired and he charged me less than I thought it would be. And he's just such a beautiful guy and what he's doing is he's shepherding in this this culture and this art and it's it's just it's I I had a great day. I had a great day. It's it's been just a fascinating conversation. Um, and I, I can't, I can't thank you enough for talking to us today, uh, Max. It's, uh, it's been really great. I, I have to end it by saying, you stay cool, sir. Stay cool forever. I have to end it by saying that. <laughs> you know, I'm saying it. Ted, Ted, really, there's a photograph of he and I that somebody took. I think it was Adam Kimmel, but it may have been the, uh, it may have been the uh, still photographer, and where he's giving me some direction of where to go as I deliver that line and where I'm about to drive off into and in the shot, it's a shot of that moment in time. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to have been a part of Ted Demi's life and the life of beautiful girls and, and the, uh, the real land and town in, in which that exists because it's a beautiful place with beautiful girls, beautiful boys and a beautiful place to grow up in. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks so much, Max. That's a great way to end it. I love Ted. I love, I have a, a special place, very special place for Ted and anything about Ted in my heart and it won't ever die. It was fire lit. All right. Well, that, that's Don. fantastic, Max. And listen, all the best in the future of your career and what you're working on now. We can't wait to watch it and talk about it again at a future date. And thank you so much for all of your time. This has been so generous of you. And uh, yeah, just the best of luck. Stay well, stay happy, stay healthy. And uh, we'll no doubt talk again down the road, sir. Thank you, John. You are a gentleman. All right. Bye now. Have a good night.